Hi, welcome back to Box to the Lights and welcome to this Grim Slingers playthrough. Grim Slingers is published by Greenbrier Games and is designed and illustrated by Stephen Gibson. You're looking at the first edition game, this is now in a second edition. There are a few subtle rule changes between first and second edition. I'm going to play first edition rules. There might be some where I tweak a little and uh, go for those second edition rules. But I want to play the cards as written. There have been some errata and some card changes for second edition. There's also a Kickstarter going on right now for the first expansion to this game. This one plays one to four. You can play a co-op game. You can play up to six players. There's a Grimslinger's Jewels, which adds another set of cards that allows you to play head to head. Uh, co-op campaign can be played solo or cooperatively. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to hit you with the second scenario in that campaign. We're set up, ready to go here. We're starting, like I say, in chapter two, scenario two. This is the story booklet. This is the rule booklet. And this, the, the campaign is called Tall Tales. And this is where each section of the campaign is split into chapters. In the beginning of the, each chapter, you can either continue from where you left off at the previous one, or like we're playing The King's Fall, it tells you if you're starting chapter two and not continuing, it gives you some setup. It says start at level four and draw four random items. So here's my hero, this is my Grim Slinger. Here's a selection of some of the other characters you can play. They, there's no difference between these characters, it's purely artwork. All right, But that was one of the main draws of the game. Uh, the artwork here is really well done. So if you want to play a cat or a one with a bear. Each one's got a, their own little backstory. The Fluenoir and the Br Professor, for example. Here's my guy. He's called Asda Quick. The man's watched his fair share of seasons come and go in the Forgotten West. He doesn't say much, but folks suppose he's used up most his words in them journals he keeps chronicling the goings on. You see, this is kind of a Wild West theme. We're going to be presented with a series of duels, battles, where we're fighting different enemies of the, the Grim Slinger universe. Each hero, although himself doesn't have a character, he does have an archetype. So you can mix and match these archetypes. I'm an outlaw and that determines my starting health and energy. Energy is what I use to cast spells. Uh, each archetype, the outlaw, as well as some flavour text here, and starting stats has an ability. And I'll show you this as we get into it. Um, I'm level 4, which means my hand size has been increased by 1. Starting hand size is normally 7 in a normal game. We've gone up to 8. And we can draw a new signature spell of our choosing. Signature spell, I've chosen Pandora, but we start with 6 spells. You've got fire, lightning, wind, ice, earth, and water. I'll show you how these work, but these are the basis of our duel. And then we've got this one here, a signature spell, a special spell with special powers. I've chosen Pandora not for any particular reason other than it allows me to actually use one random um, signature spell from the deck. So this was just a w good way of exposing you guys to lots of different signature spells. There's lots of different archetypes. We've got the Revenant, Outlaw, Forgotten, Witchborn demon and vampire, each with their own special ability. So there's lots of variability, even though the base characters themselves don't have any differences. Um, there are six different archetypes here. The thing about the Tall Tales campaign is it's a series of duels, but there's encounters and flavor and story, and getting new items, finding stuff, encountering events throughout the scenario that kind of punctuate those, those different duels, those dual encounters with, with the monsters. Okay, So let's head into chapter two then, the King's Fall, and just, let's just get playing this thing. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, probably we'll just do part one. Uh, the aim here is we're going to head up to the end of the chapter and they may well be like a, an end boss to defeat. There's a prerequisite to part one, Kindred Bones. Place your character piece on the Owl's Magic Market map node. 
these are the pieces that come with the game. I've substituted out just because I prefer the look of uh, this kind of pawn here and this different coloured die. This is a Harsey's dice from Gatekeeper Games. Um, okay, Arles Magic Carpet's over here. And the scenario board has got nodes on it. We can travel around uh, and, and find different encounters. This is what's driving the scenario. The action now. Next time players visit Hank the Hunter, they may hire him for free. Our objective, travel in any direction in search of clues. It would be a good idea to visit Hank the Hunter before you finally challenge the Witch King. Okay, so we're going to face the Witch King. This is kind of our nemesis. That might be a little bit of an understatement. Let me show you a picture of the Witch King. <laughs> yeah, pretty mean looking guy, right? Okay. Now, I don't want to spoil too much of the story, but the prerequisites to part two. So how do we get into part two? Uh, must have resolved at least two nodes, attack or event, since starting chapter two. Okay, remember we're on chapter two, part one. All right, let's head out. Let's see, what are these nodes all about and how does this game play? There's a turn order here. Um, if I look at Tall Tales, we start with the narrative phase. Check the prerequisites. Check to see if you meet the prerequisites of the next story part. We don't. Resolve any actions required on the part of the story. There's none. Well, we kind of, it kind of was, right? Chapter 2. The next time the players visit Hank the Hunter, they may hire him. Uh, continue on. If you've not just resolved the end of the chapter, continue on to the next phase. We haven't. So the next phase is the node resolution phase. It says resolve the type of map node you are on. Well, we're on Owl's Magic Market, which is a landmark node. It says page 19. When we hit a landmark node, we read the story booklet on that page. So let's go in and continue the story. Owl's Magic Market. A peculiar market filled with merchants looking to sell their talents to weary wanderers. Owl Pontoon established the market long before the Valley Haven came about and has refused to relocate. Convenience be damned. Business seems to be doing well, all the things considered. Each player may trade with any of the following merchants. The landmark node counts as a rest node. Okay, so we can trade with the shaman. Uh, we can be rejuvenated in exchange for goods, restoring our health points and energy points to maximum. Warlock, warlock be endowed with power. Um, I can discard six items in exchange for one level. Or the siphoner, trade your essence for rare goods. Deduct your choice of health or energy, and for every four I deduct, you can draw one item card. Okay. Now as it goes, there's one thing that we haven't yet done as part of Chapter 2's setup. It said, if you're starting Chapter 2, you may start at Level 4 and draw four random items. So let's get four random items and see what we get. I don't want to do any more trading as it goes, so we're just going to push on. Okay, I've got a Mana Worm, plus two energy points. Some supplies, plus one HP, one plus one EP. A discarded artifact, throw it at the target for one damage. And an energy well. Uh, play with any spell and the, energies, uh, the spell's energy cost will be zero. Now, I'm going to put these here in what's called our stash. At the start of the game, remember, we've got a hand size of seven plus one. We've got eight. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've only got room for seven cards. I might... Um, yeah, I can only hold one more card. So I might just take this discarded artifact, put this in my hand. Okay, so I've got eight cards now. All right? Maximum hand size. And it also said that Arles Market counts as a rest node. On a rest node, we can either reload or purge. Um, I'll tell you about those at a certain time. These are the abilities of our anima here. Uh, reorganize my hands and stash, which I've just done. Trade cards with teammates and use items that have type standoff. Okay, there's different types of items. This one says combine, this one says standoff, this is standoff. So I can actually use 
my supplies here to gain one health point, one energy point. You can't go above your maximum, so eight, eight was my maximum. Okay, these trackers here track your health and energy. Energy is what you use to, to cast spells or do effects of spells. Okay. All right, let's push on. Um, node resolution is done. Now it's movement. So here we decide where, which map node we want to move to next. Remember, we're looking for Hank the Hunter, which is over here. And there's three nodes leading off here. We've got a movement up to here, which is an event. And we've got a movement down here, which is an attack node. And I think we're going to go this way. I'm going to head through this attack node, then maybe Valley Haven up to Hank the Hunter. All right, let's go down to this attack node, because I want to show you how duels work. Moving to an attack node, we've got to roll the dice. And this will tell us what type of baddie we're going to encounter. We rolled a three, and this says we're going to encounter a peyote scorpion. Here's the scorpion. I'm going to take his portrait card. These are some of the other enemies you can face. We've got bandits, a jackalope, a dune worm spectre, and a chupacabra. Right, so portrait down. We're now going to give it some energy and health, just like we have. On the back of the portrait, it says it's starting health and energy for one player is five and five. Okay. It says if defeated players may draw the peyote poison ritual item card from the item deck. Each player gains one level and may draw one random item from the deck. So you can see that defeating creatures, you may say, why did you, why the heck did you choose an attack node? Attack node? All right, I wanted to show you how it worked, but also the rewards are really great. Okay. And these trackers, so it starts with five health. Here's a health tracker, energy tracker, five energy. So we place them such that those numbers line up with the arrows. And as he takes damage, this is going to clock down. And this one too. You see? Pretty neat, huh? We're now going to take a random creature modifier. On the normal mode, this is one random modifier. Easy mode. No, 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 it's hard. You take two. And we can see that it's dead. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll discard that one. It says, do not duel this creature. Gain the rewards for its defeat except for gaining levels. All right, so we found a dead scorpion. All right, well, uh, that's not going to teach us very much, is it, about the game? All right, let's get uh, gigantic. So we've got this gigantic scorpion instead. This creature gets plus two to both its starting and maximum health points and energy points per player. All right, so a gigantic scorpion is more like it. Let's put his health up by two to seven. And it's energy. Sorry for cheating already, but you know. I want to show you what I want to show you, right? Okay, now we take it, the creature skills deck. This is the Peyote Scorpion's skill deck. There's three of them. And we're going to shuffle these with the generic uh, general creature skills. All right? Okay, job done. Skill deck over here. Now we're ready to begin our duel. Now I want to knock this creature down. There's one thing missing from the rule book, and that is not only can you kill it by knocking its health to zero, but you can also kill it by knocking its energy to zero. So I'm going to start. I don't really know what's going to come out here, but let's try and start with a big hit. Uh, we start with the standoff phase. The standoff phase is where we choose one of our cards. Um, we can exchange cards from our hand to our stash, um, but I can't then do any other actions except for um, playing standoff item cards and an archetype ability. We could instead use our anima ability, which says reload. Put four discarded spells back in our hand. It costs three energy. Purge. Discard up to two spells. Um, getting one energy point for each. The other thing we can do is surge. If we surge, we get plus one to the numeric value of the effects of any spells I play, and also ignore anything that causes me to exhaust. 
Um, to pay this, I have to deactivate three spells. A surge is a great way to kind of get an initial jump on the enemy. Um, so I might do that. I might play lightning, uh, which does three damage, uh, with a surge. So surge is going to add one to the numeric values. So this says target takes three damage and gains one energy, and a surge would um, add one to numeric values. So target takes four damage and gains two energy. To deactivate spells, you just place them in a deactivated spot next to your anima. In fact, this becomes a draw discard pile, and then you have a deactivated pile here. So let's choose three spells to deactivate it. I'm going to deactivate water, wind, and uh, this is an item. Uh, ice. Okay. Deactivate. So now when we play this lightning, we're going to do four damage, um, and our enemy gains two EP. Right. De deactivate your cards. Go face down. And now we can play our spell, lightning. Normally you play this face down in the duel. All players will play their cards face down, and then in the draw phase, which is coming next, we flip them face up. We're playing solo, so we don't really need to do that. We just draw a card for the creature, and it says hide. Now we resolve these cards. We do that in resolution number order. This is a nine. This is a three. Okay, and it says somehow they managed to duck out of our view for a few minutes. All foes take turns choosing an action. So that's us. We're a foe of the scorpion. Roll a die. Um, is action two. On a one, two, three, we find them and resolve normally. Four, five, six, we can't find them and nothing happens. Or we could just choose to say jokes on them. We'll rest up. They've got it hidden, but we're going to take the opportunity to gain one energy, sorry, gain one health and two energy. But we don't want to do that. So let's roll the dice to search for them. Okay, we're looking for a one, two, or a three. It's a three. Excellent. Good, good, good. So we found them. You may resolve any cards you played this turn. So lightning's going to resolve. Target takes three damage and gains one energy point, while it's going to be four damage and gain two energy. And the creature's already at max uh, starting HP of seven, so he can't go up on here, but he can take the damage. So it's going to be four damage. Remember, it's three plus one for my surge. So he's down to uh, four damage, down to three health already. Excellent. Okay, this card gets discarded. This card gets discarded. Now, any cards that were deactivated in a previous turn would now return to my hand. Okay, these aren't from a previous turn. And what you need to do is kind of shift them up to show that next time the deactivated cards are going to go here, and then the aftermath phase of the next round, these cards are going to come back to my hand. Okay, we'll flip back over so we're no longer surged. And we're back in the standoff phase of the next round, and hopefully these abilities will make a little bit more diff uh, sense to you now. So reload, put four discarded cards back into your hand, okay, spells rather, or purge, discard up to two spells and gain one EP for each. Okay, so now we know a little bit more about what energy is used for, um, and how we get cards from our discard pile back into our hand. Okay, now we're going to try and finish this guy off, and we're going to do this a little bit more cleverly. In fact, I'm going to use my signature spell. Um, I'm going to use Pandora. So I'm going to play this face down. Now, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to play this discarded artifact. I'm going to throw, throw it at a target for one damage. Okay. It's a standard. This a standard item it just gets used instead of a normal spell. But what I'm going to do too is use my Dirty Cheat ability. Dirty Cheat says during the draw phase I can play a spell for two energy points. So I'm going to go from 8 down to 6. In addition to its energy point cost, I'm going to play Pandora at 0. After you and everyone else has played their cards. Okay? Your card will do no damage. Pandora doesn't do any damage anyway. But any other effects it has will be applied. So draw one for the creature. We pay up 2 energy. Now we play Pandora. We've got 2 spells down on the board. Okay, Pretty neat, huh? And it says, 
And we're still in the draw phase, we haven't revealed these cards yet. In fact, I can put this face down just to illustrate that fact. Draw a random signature spell from the deck. Okay, here's our deck of signature spells. And immediately resolve it. And uh, it will receive plus one to the numeric value of its effect and return the spell to the deck afterwards. Okay, let's grab a random card. Okay, in fact, I'm going to keep the signature spell deck face down because I've got Pandora. Okay. And it's Siphon. DNC and choose to steal that amount in HP or EP. Cannot steal more than the target has. Well, that's a beautiful effect. So we, it doesn't have a numeric value, so the plus one is not going to count. But we do get to resolve it. And it says DNC, draw numeric card, that stands for. These are the draw numeric cards. It's a bunch of playing cards from one to five. I'm just going to shuffle them up. So we're going to draw one and we get to steal that many either energy or health. It's a two. Let's get shuffled back in. Siphon goes back to the deck. Shuffle it back in. That's our signature spells. Pandora's spent. We can steal two energy or two health. Now, I can't steal health, I'm already at maximum health, so I'm going to put my energy up two, back to eight, and heals energy will go down from seven to five. Okay, not what I was looking for, but hey ho. All right, now let's draw. I'm going to resolve these in numerical order. He's got frenzy of an RN of 9, mine's got an RN of 2, so mine's going to go first. It doesn't stop to do anything special, but it looks valuable. Throw it at a target for 1 damage. If this item is traded, it counts as 2 cards. Alright, I didn't change it, tried it. So it's going to do 1 damage. Not quite enough, from 3 down to 2. Frenzy says, with an impressive burst of energy, they come at each of us and they meant harm. All foes take 5 damage. Any aim with 3 energy points to dodge his attack and avoid taking damage. Yeah, I'm going to do that. So, 8 down to 5 energy. Keeps my health at maximum. Okay, discard. These deactivated cards come back to my hand. And we're ready for the next turn. He's got 2 health left. So I really want to hit this guy. I'm going to surge just in case he has some damage reducing effects and I'm going to play Ice. Target takes 2 damage and I have to deactivate 3 spells ok, there's 3 um, I could go and grab some stuff for my stash but I've surged so I can't alright, that's fine it's one of the scorpion skills now. Let's get ready to draw. He's got claw clamp. RN of 8, so this one's going first. The creature scuttled around before leaping forward at me with the utmost prejudice. Its rigid claws clamped down like a hungry jaws of a mangy dog. Foes must take turns to draw a numeric card without reshuffling until one draws a 5. The foe then that drew a 5 is attacked. Well, it's going to be me. If there's only one foe, they are automatically attacked. The attacked foe must discard two random active cards and take four damage. Any unresolved cards currently targeting this creature will deal double, double damage. Okay, active cards are cards in my hand. So we discard two active cards and take four damage. So he's really put a stranglehold on my hand. Uh, we're going to take 4 damage, so it's 8 down to 4. But any unresolved cards currently targeting this creature will deal double damage. That's um, 6 damage. He's dead. Yeah, we've killed him. Okay, job done. The scorpion is out of here. And we get the rewards. If defeated, players may draw the Peyote Poison Ritual item card from the item deck. Each player also gains one level and may draw one random item from the deck. Well, that's pretty sweet. We're going to go up to level 5. Nothing special given to us at level 5. When we get to level 6, we get our hand size increased to 9. We get one random item. Let's take it. It's a woolly ward. Unconventional, but yet desperate. 
I'm immune to all damage this phase. <laughs> you monster. Okay, let's put that in our hand. And then we get to take the Poyote Poison Ritual card. There it is, Poyote Poison. Okay, let's shuffle this back up. This deck's quite thick because I've sleeved the cards. You don't have to sleeve them. Um, for some reason, I decided this was the game I would do it for. This item says, combine with a uh, standard type card that does damage. If the target has any unresolved cards, they must discard them immediately. Pretty nasty. Okay, let's put that in my stash. Oh, incidentally, the um, discarded artifact. I put that in my discard pile. It shouldn't. All items are discarded once they're used. So it's their one-time use. There's some that say, um, do not discard. Now, in second edition, do not discard. doesn't stay in your hand. It goes to your deactivated pile. Okay. Uh, scorpion. So general creature cards, they go back. Scorpion, may, yeah, we may find another one in the desert. And creature modifier, that will get shuffled back in as well. All deactivated cards go back to your hand. Discard pile though stays the same, but I could find another location to rest at, and when I rest, I can take cards back into my hand. I've also got four, my hand size is uh, eight, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, that's it, we've resolved this node, we then get to move on.